Well, a warm welcome to everyone on this finally Sunday afternoon. It's almost spring here in our Boston College campus. My name is Christian DuPont, and I'm the director of the John J. Burns Library for Rare Book Special Collections and Archives here at Boston College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all of our Boston College libraries, of which there are seven on our campus here. Our library uh, director, uh, Tom Wall, is with us, and along with several of our library colleagues. So, uh, welcome on behalf of uh, to all of you, especially those in our surrounding community here. I know I've just met a couple more of you from our Chestnut Hill neighborhood who like to come in and wonder, can, can I come into the libraries? Yes, you can, on any occasion, not just for events like this, but otherwise. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to, to have our local community uh, be with us. We're also very pleased uh, and honored to have uh, with us our uh, Consul General of Ireland with us this afternoon, who just wandered in. Shane Coughlin has been a, a regular here since coming to Boston Oh, just after Saint, just before St. Patrick's Day for all those festivities, it seems you can't get enough of all the great events we do here. So, so, so welcome and, and thank you for uh, again representing Ireland. I know this is a topic of really great interest to you and obviously the others of you gathered here. Uh, this is our 36th uh, Burns Scholar lecture, and that's sort of a magical number. I'm somebody, if you know me, likes Dante a lot. He's pictured these windows, and there's a certain numerology. You can get threes and fours and nines and perfect numbers out of 36. And, of course, we have uh, uh, Jason Kirk as our 36th uh, Burns Scholar, who has a certain numerology of his own. Uh, some of you will have read in the BC Chronicle the nice article that Sean Smith did about you as the first American Burns Scholars, and that got some of us, uh, I think I see Beth Sweeney and, and Kathy Williams from our, our Burns Library staff scratch your head because he said, we've known a lot of Burns Scholars, and let's see how this works out. Well, we had Lauren Arrington here last fall, and Lauren is American-born, but she was uh, was trained uh, in Ireland and is now teaching at Liverpool, so she checked one of the boxes in that way. Uh, I think we said Mick Maloney, right, he's been born in Ireland and, uh, and then came over and did studies in us, and of course now he's a musicologist and a musician based in New York through New York University, so he checked two of the boxes, but Jason, you check all three. You are you're American born, you're American trained, and teaching at the Central uh, at Central Washington University. So, uh, in that perfect numerology of threes, you are an <laughs> opportunity. So, with that, uh, I will end my welcome remarks, except to say, uh, please do all of you stay and join us downstairs immediately after our question and discussion period for a very nice reception in our in our Burns Library. And those of you who are coming for the first time will have a chance to see a little bit more of the library itself. And, I'll be glad to talk to you more about that. Uh, but to introduce Jason more fully, properly, and, and academically, I will uh, have uh, uh, James Murphy, our director of Center for Irish Programs, come to the podium uh, and do that honor. So thank you. I'm also an American citizen. I'm honored to <laughs> Six. 
seed. So, um, in these days, here's a little dig at the way our studies is developing, where everything about independent Ireland until it's almost 20 years ago is always derided as being awful. It's nonetheless a great achievement uh, that, that Ireland, in its independent phase, uh, achieved, uh, uh, the, the state, the Irish state achieved, among its own people, a sense of legitimacy, uh, a sense of that consent. Um, and and uh, the Irish government was, was a parliamentary form of government, different from our own United States, but, but similar in some ways. And key to a parliamentary uh, uh, system is the idea that the parties in Parliament all assent to the way the country is governed, that those who are not in power, not forming the majority, not forming the government, um, they, they can be critical of the government without wanting the destruction of the state. And that's a difficult trick to manage, and that's what um, Professor Knurk has been uh, working on. And what, what's radical about it is he says that this, uh, this dates from the 1920s only, and I think he is he's correct in this, um, but in that he, he tramples over the, the fond fantasies of the past. Here's a famous book edited by Brian Farrell. No, no dust jacket, but anyway, Brian Farrell. This one, actually, Brian Farrell's an interesting person in the good old days in, in Irish public broadcasting. You have people who straddle the academic world and the, and the broadcasting world. And this book was edit, 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 edited by Brian Farrell in 1973. It's called The Irish Parliamentary Tradition. And so it tries to make a case that the, the parliamentary tradition in Ireland dates back to, 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 you know, to, to, to hundreds of years. Um, the Gaelic Ireland, I mean, there's, there are, in fact, 16 essays. They, they start in the Middle Ages, and they, they make an argument for there being some kind of a, a tradition, parliamentary tradition in Ireland through all those centuries. And there's two ways of talking about tradition. Firstly, if you see similarities between different periods, and I think that's not a very helpful way of seeing tradition. I think a uh, much more helpful way of seeing tradition is something which has some kind of organic uh, uh, continuity. And in that sense, there really, I agree with Professor Knerk, there really is no Irish parliamentary uh, tradition until the period, he's, as he's going to show, until the, the 1920s. I was under the fond delusion that there might be in the 19th century. That's why recently I turned my attention to, when I was yet unfinished work in Dublin Corporation, in the fond hope of discovering their parliamentary tradition, and I haven't found it, so I, I commend you. You're right, I was wrong. Nonetheless, <laughs> still going to write a book on it because there's still really interesting things. <laughs> never waste your research, undergraduates. Never let it go to waste. Never let it go to waste. Make some use of it. So, no, it will be an excellent book when it comes out. I assure you. Anyway, but nonetheless, why I was deluded was because of the fond um, fantasy things people would say. For example, 1867, Sir John Gray. Dublin Corporation, uh, lauding O'Connell, who was on since at that, set, at, at that stage, said that he had opened the portals of the Constitution to his Catholic fellow countrymen against whom they were so long closed, and he created, referring to Dublin Corporation, that little civic parliament which would perhaps serve hereafter as the model of a parliament for the whole of Ireland that people cheered him, but it was not correct because Dublin Corporation in its debates never developed uh, in, into a sense of parliament for all kinds of reasons, mostly lack of power, and because, well, I don't know how much to those reasons, but it certainly did not develop in that sense. So, uh, Professor Knurk is sweeping aside uh, loose thinking and giving us what really happens. So, let me, without further ado, hand you over to So as James was saying, I've spent my um, semester here as a bird scholar sort of mulling over this question of how opposition parties behave, and how opposition parties particularly behaved in the early days of the Irish Free State. And so that's what I want to talk about today, the development of what's called a, a loyal opposition in the, uh, in the early Irish Free State. Um, by loyal opposition, I mean an opposition party that is basically loyal to the institutions of the state, but opposing the government in power. And at least in the way I look at it, that didn't really exist with the Irish party, the Home Rule Party. That didn't really exist during the Revolution. And so I'm sort of looking at its development, its evolution, during the 1920s, OK? Um, reduced to its core, my argument is that this standard feature of parliamentary government 
was one of the hardest aspects of democracy to establish in the free state, and is therefore crucial in understanding why democracy was able to take root and maybe thrive is too strong a word, but uh, mm -hmm. become institutionalized in the 1920s at a time when democracy was generally collapsing across Europe. So what I would like to do today is to sketch out how briefly how other historians and political scientists have studied the birth of Irish democracy, discuss some of the difficulties in the establishment of a loyal opposition in Ireland, and then look at the role, briefly, of the Labour and Farmers Party in modeling the role or the acts of a loyal opposition in the 1920s and the early Free State Parliaments. Um, as is well known, the Free State was one of the first European, or one of the few European countries to remain democratic. One of the free, uh, let me start that again. As is well known, except obviously to me, who can't be it's a surprise to me, it's just on the telephone. Um, as is well known, the Irish Free State was one of the few European countries created in the wake of the First World War that remained democratic throughout the interwar period. Um, a feat made more remarkable by the fact that it came on the heels of a bitter civil war and coincided with the general post-war economic slump that was particularly devastating in the critical, uh, to the Irish, area of agriculture. Um, as a result, the birth and the stabilization of Irish democracy has attracted a fair amount of attention from historians and political scientists eager to explain the free state's lack of normal left-right politics and also the rather quick incorporation of the civil war opposition into the regular parliamentary order by the end of the 1920s. Um, a number of scholars have pointed to societal or structural factors in explaining Ireland's tradition, transition to post-colonial democracy. Such factors include the support of the Catholic Church for democracy, which was generally not present in, say, France or Italy during this period. Um, the relative ethnic and religious homogeneity of the free state after partition, high literacy rates, the partial solution of the land problem with the availability of government uh, backed loans for land purchase after 1903, and what James was alluding to, the familiarity of the Irish people with democratic processes and procedures under the British colonial state. The latter factor included both experience with elections and election campaigns, but also the greater democratization of local government after 1898 and the reform that was passed then. Um, there also has been a focus on elite attitudes. Biographies of figures on both sides of the Civil War, including Michael Collins, Kevin O'Higgins, Cosgrave, De Valera, Lamas, um, have emphasized their fundamental, if at times wobbling, commitment to democratic values and their basic unwillingness to institutionalize authoritarian um, structures. Um, Tom Garvin, in particular, most, most directly in this 1922, The Birth of Irish Democracy, a political scientist, Tom Garvin, has further narrowed this analysis, concluding that the victors in the Civil War, those who supported the Compromise Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, were more democratic, or at least more majoritarian, than the Republicans that they defeated. Garvin and some other political scientists have argued that the Treatyites came out of a tradition that was more individualistic, more rooted in the Enlightenment, and more tolerant of dissent than the proponents. Finally, the work of John Regan, who will actually, I think, be here speaking in Boston to ACES, uh, to the American Conference for Irish Studies next year, um, has argued that neither side of the treaty split was particularly democratic, and that the threat of British interference if the treaty were rejected prevented the implementation of anything approaching true democracy. Um, those works that focus on elite attitudes, by and large, have analyzed Sinn Féin elites, elites that come from the party that made the revolution. Um, and those that focus on structural factors have, for the most part, invoked factors that are perceived to have smoothed the way for democracy to take root. Um, my new book project, I say new quite optimistically, I've been messing with this for years, but uh, <laughs> how about unreleased? My unreleased book project, in contrast, <laughs> looks at a wider group of political actors and studies a factor the absence of which could have threatened democracy, the legitimacy of an opposition that supported the state but opposed the government. Once the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921 split the revolutionary movement and led to the Civil War, the party that won the second most parliamentary seats in the election of 1922, the Anti-Treaty Act Republicans, then still called Sinn Féin, abstained from the new parliament between 1922 and 1927. The Labour and Farmers parties, as well as a variety of independent deputies, decided to enter the doll. And my contention, or at least my contention in this portion of the project, is that these groups, the activities of these groups as an opposition to the treaty I government during this period were critical in the development of Irish democracy. Even though they could not outvote the government, they ensured a multi-party parliament and they normalized pluralism. 
Most of the historical attention is focused on the anti-treatyite journey from military opposition to semi-constitutional to uh, the government in 1932, and that's important. But I think the role of these minor parties is important and often, often overlooked. Um, while recent historians and political scientists have often focused on factors that enable or stabilize democracy, politicians of the time in the 1920s were nearly unanimous in claiming that Irish democracy was unstable, inchoate, undefined, and poorly understood by the population. They thought that they needed to educate the population in both democratic attitudes and democratic practices. They thought, in short, that democracy, both in its ideals and its habits, was something that had to be learned, reinforced, and constantly explained. This belief that democracy had to be built is what led me to this ana analysis of the construction of notions of opposition. The idea and practice of a loyal opposition was something that I think had been largely absent in pre-revolutionary national politics, for sure, um, yet seemed necessary for a functioning parliamentary state. Irish politics, at least in the late 19th century, did not seem to give the electorate experience with a loyal opposition. For as for much of its life, the pre-revolutionary Irish party, the Home Rule Party, had basically sought to secede from the Westminster Parliament, not to build up its institutions. It also, at, at times, used tactics of obstructionism and withdrawal to further these goals. The political culture of the Irish Revolution also made it more difficult to establish a loyal opposition. The revolutionaries created a parliament, Dáil Éireann, but much of the practice of politics by Sinn Féin, the Revolutionary Party, during the Revolution, militated against the development of a loyal opposition. First, the Revolutionary Dáil was a one-party parliament. Here's the map of the, of, of the electoral results of 1918. Sinn Féin swept the boards, except for in the north. Uh, Redmond's constituency in Waterford. The Trinity College seats in Dublin, and a uh, seat in Liverpool. Um, the the uh, various northern parties and the remnants of the Irish party did not accept an invitation to attend the first revolutionary parliament. So it's a one-party state. Okay? Labor chose not to run candidates in 1918 and 1921. And so basically only Sinn Feiners were in the parliament. Okay? This had considerable effects on post-revolutionary politics as it created a particular path to revolutionary credibility. It gave a certain moral standing and legitimacy to those who had taken part in the military or political wings of the revolution. That was generally the path to getting known. These men, and the, in general, the, the case of women is different. I have a whole book on that that I won't get into. Um, <laughs> these men did not have to justify or explain their presence in parliament. Everyone knew their records of service and sacrifice to the nation. And the implication was that their opinion mattered more than that of the average non-participant. It was harder for those without such credentials to establish legitimacy. And those who were neither soldiers nor male Sinn Féin activists had to justify their place in the doll and their ability to speak for the nation or for their constituencies. Second, the revolutionary doll met in conditions not particularly conducive to the raising of oppositional views. It generally met in secret, infrequently, and on short notice, especially after its banning by the British government in September of 1919. As a result, the cabinet retained a fair amount of autonomy and was not very communicative with ordinary doll members. This actually caused some friction. There were complaints about the Belfast boycott, the attempt to uh, boycott products uh, coming from Belfast. There were complaints about personnel decisions that were made without uh, Parliament's approval. But generally speaking, ordinary TDs, ordinary members of the doll, were too harried, too ill-informed to really mount sustained opposition to cabinet policies. Uh, Sean McEntee, at the time, lamented, quote, under the present circumstances, there could be no real opposition to the ministry. Meetings of the doll were got through hurriedly, and there could be very little discussion on many important subjects. Roger Sweetman, another uh, TD who often dissented, agreed that, quote, it was very undemocratic to have to dispose of important questions in the few minutes that could be devoted to them under present circumstances. In addition to political practice, the culture of the revolutionary movement inhibited opposition. There was an obsession with uh, maintaining and displaying revolutionary unity, with dissent often equated with treason or apostasy. The cabinet's public statements always emphasized unity, sometimes to ridiculous lengths. A statement from Arthur Griffith bragged, quote, the ministry were working in perfect harmony. Their decisions were always unanimous. De Valera chastised members of the cabinet for showing divided opinions before the doll, and rather implausibly said that when the British arrested him in June 1921, quote, 
they found a statement signed by every one of the ministry of Dal Aaron, saying that never at any time during the whole period of their office had there been any difference of opinion between me and them as regard to <laughs> policy and that. That just happened to be on him when he was arrested. Right? So, um, even after the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty brought a lot of these existing disputes out into the open, after 1921, de Valera referred to this as a, quote, accidental division of opinion in the cabinet, as if it revealed nothing of sort of previous tactical and policy differences. Um, even as Sinn Féin members expressed significant differences about the treaty's placement of the free state within the empire and about the future direction of the Irish state, they still longed to recreate the perceived unity of the revolutionary period. And I think there are several reasons why this idea of unity was so talismanic for revolutionaries at the time. First, it was thought by all that open division only served the purposes of England. One of the myths dearly held by Irish nationalists of all stripes was that England fostered or even created division in Ireland in order to make the island easier to subjugate. From 1798, when religious strife wrecked any hope of a successful rising, to the disputes between Young Ireland and O'Connell in the 18, 1840s, internal turmoil had always been perceived to strengthen England's hand. Um, in 1921, doll member Kathleen Clark, Tom Clark's widow, worried that the treaty would function similarly. She said the result will be a divided people. The same old division will go on. Those who will enter the British Empire and those who will not. And England's old game of divide and conquer goes on. The shadow of the Parnell split was also on the TD's minds, as they worried that an open division over the treaty could lead to the weakness and dissension that the pre-revolutionary Irish party had suffered through in the 1890s. Donald Callahan said, the people of the country, even those who desire the treaty ratified, are still keener about avoiding the return of days of internal divisions and party turmoil. Patrick McCartan invoked Parnell in advocating a delay in any post-treaty election. To put an issue like this to the country again, you want to have a repetition of what occurred in the Parnell split. You've seen it here in the Dáil, and it will be intensified a hundredfold in the country. This disdain for division was connected to a disdain for party politics and career politicians. Um, party, just like in the French Revolution, party and politics became dirty words, basically, in the revolutionary debates. Um, as factions formed within Sinn Féin in the wake of a treaty, each side accused the other of playing party politics, by which was generally meant that the perceived interests of the nation were being subordinated to selfish political aims. De Valera told the Dáil in March 1922, quote, we hear a lot about party methods. Party has gone mad here. From the other side, Kevin O'Higgins' pamphlet, Civil War and the Events Which Led to It, under the heading Party Intoxication, argued that Erskine Childers, quote, normally orderly and logical mind was under the influence of the baneful spirit of party and badly intoxicated with the spirit of party. <laughs> O'Higgins was always trying to go after intoxication, right? Closing the closure of pubs, bills in 1923 and 27. Um, Cosgrave urged deputies to get away from the page of party politics and the page of party suspicion and the page of party speeches and realize that the nation did not elect us to go on with this nonsense. Both sides accused their opponents of having the party spirit, which contrasted with the national spirit of the revolution. Sinn Féin portrayed itself as a movement or a national party that brought unity instead of factionalism, an emphasis that contributed to the dismay and confusion with which the treaty split was met by a lot of Sinn Féin, particularly uh, non elite Sinn Féin. Party discipline was also thought to, re to weaken reasoned and unfettered debate on an issue, as de deputies would vote along party lines rather than according to the strengths of the arguments presented. There was one aspect of revolutionary political culture that on its face might have paved the way for a loyal opposition, and that is the elevation of minorities, political minorities, as moral beacons and national vanguards. 19th century Irish rebellions, from Robert Emmett to the Fenians, had been carried out by advanced minorities that were hailed as principled despite tactical failure. Once the treaty split occurred, the anti-treaty Republican minority, which had found itself outvoted in the cabinet and in the parliament, retreated to the self-image of a sanctified minority. They compared themselves to the Easter rebels, who had been criticized during and immediately after the revolution only to or the rebellion, only to find their point of view embraced by the wider or a wider Irish population within a couple of years. This was the hope of anti-treatyites as well. And while they were in the minority, they attempted to raise the status of such a position and limit the rights of the majority. This is most succinctly expressed in de Valera's famous dictum that the people have no right to do wrong. Right? But Republicans also argued that they represented the soul of the nation, the attitudes of its future citizens, and the heroes of its past. The majority had no right, it was argued, to trample on any of these constituencies. 
After the treaty passed and the treatyites moved to set up a government, Palabrua referred to it as, quote, this usurping government that has been brought into existence by the majority. Right? So it's both majoritarian and usurping. Right? The rights of the majority were then limited by certain fundamental principles. The Republican paper New Ireland in May 1922 and held here in Burns Library highlighted a 1915 quote from Treaty Ida Owen McNeil on its front page so as to show that Sinn Féin's suspicion of electoral majorities was not new. The quote read, there is nothing sacred in majority rule. The divine right of majorities is no better established than the divine right of kings. A majority can be tyrannical and its tyranny can be of a very oppressive kind. There is nothing sacred in the power of 51 men over 49, nor even in the power of 99 men over one. That the decision of a majority should hold good is merely a principle of order, not of liberty or justice. Another editorial in the same paper, entitled Majority Rule Gone Mad, noted that, quote, the uncritical application of any principle reduces it to the absurd. What, <clears throat> so even for self-determination, the right of majority rule, what then are the limits to this principle? Remember that the real will of the people means the will expressed which stands for the highest interests of the people. You know the majority is not always in favor of the thing which is in its highest interest. So a temporary majority couldn't threaten the highest interests of the people, which the Republicans were generally defined as sovereign independence. Because the church generally took the pro-treaty side in 1922, Republicans also went to great lengths to divorce the concept of majority rule from that of moral law. Majority rule was not a sacrosanct principle, but simply a rule of order, one that could be ignored when the existence of the nation was at stake. This discussion about the meaning of majority and minority within Irish politics stripped from the obvious, strip, yes, from the obvious Republican self-interest in denigrating the, the temporary poor treaty majority, highlights a fundamental question about the rights of minorities within a democratic system. The connection of minority status with moral superiority boded well, it seemed, for anyone outside the majority. However, the way it was framed by Republicans tended to define a minority as a vanguard within the national movement. The rights that minorities could uphold against the majority were those of national sovereignty and freedom from external interference not internal matters such as civil or economic rights. And the minority in this case was depicted as guarding a sovereignty that existed outside of parliament, the nation, and not within parliament. So the model of minority behavior theorized and enacted by Republicans actually provided little utility for non-Republicans like labor, trying to set up a loyal parliamentary opposition. So the takeaway from the revolutionary period is that revolutionary politics was a terrain that was in many ways unfavorable to the creation of a loyal opposition. Ireland had little history of such practice, and the revolutionary emphasis on national unity and the elevation of Sinn Féin IRA experience as a legitimating factor in politics created obstacles for non-Sinn Féin politicians. The revolutionary denigration of politics and party caused similar effects. Dissent and opposition was increasingly seen as anti-national, selfish, and implicitly helpful to the former colonial master. And these factors are why a study of the Labour Party's entrance into the Third Doll in 1922 is so critical for understanding the development of Irish democracy. After much internal wrangling among Sinn Féin elites, an electoral pact between Collins and De Valera in May 1922 allowed for a general election to take place in June of 1922. Collins and De Valera agreed that Sinn Féin would run a united slate of candidates. They would, all Sinn Féin candidates would campaign on uh, telling the public to vote for all Sinn Féin candidates, regardless of individual stances on the treaty. Okay? At the insistence, supposedly, of Collins, although there's some dispute about this, the pact also included a clause that allowed for non-Sinn Féin candidates to run for office. Yeah. Labor, the Farmers' Party, and a variety of independents took advantage of this opportunity and faced a barrage of criticism early on, particularly from Republicans, for entering the field. Under a headline that read, Independent Candidates Will Ruin Agreement, a Republican paper editorialized, It will not impress the country favorably if middle parties or labor parties put up candidates. In fact, it will prejudice labor interests if any of the candidates plunge into the controversy, no matter under what guise. Those who carried on the fight for freedom hitherto, that is to say, those candidates who have represented the Sinn Féin organization, should naturally be the people to complete the work. And there is really no scope yet in Irish public life for other interests to intervene, no matter how worthy or well-intentioned. 
Republicans criticized would-be politicians who had not participated in the revolution as, quote, people who took no part in the national struggle, some of which were hostile to the independence and others indifferent to the honor and interests of Irish nationality. And it was said that non Sinn Feiners' desire to run for office revealed fundamental selfishness or careerism, basically. Politics here was still conceived of as national, united, and anti-party. Sectional minority interests were seen as outside of this definition. Tom Johnson, the head of the Labor Party and a Liverpool Protestant, came in for particular scorn and had his national credentials repeatedly questioned. New Ireland wrote, for a considerable time, he seemed to have the outlook rather of an English labor leader than of a profound and convinced follower of the policy of James Conway. We understand he was a traveler for a big English firm, and we know that he was strongly against Sinn Féin policy from 1916 onwards. Another editorial made it clear that Johnson's decision to run as a candidate was fundamental anti fundamentally anti-national. This is also from the Republican uh, pre-Civil War era paper in New Ireland. Um, and, and it says, in his statement why he was fighting the national panel, the Sinn Féiners, Mr. Johnston, they don't even get his name right here. <laughs> Mr. Johnston refers to the national panel as a machine representation from a single political party. And by the way, both sides, both sides cited Tammany Hall and Irish American involvement in Tammany Hall as the kind of machine politics they didn't want. That was a frequent allusion, and so this is no different here. Um, so Johnston calls it machine representation. This statement is both false and insulting. The Sinn Féin movement, is not a party, it's a movement, is a national movement. It represents two parties, and the members of the last doll were, in fact, the parliamentary forces that fought for Irish freedom. They represent all sections and classes of the community, both farmers, farm laborers, businessmen, and the professions. To refer to the national movement in such terms is false. It is ungrateful in view of their courage in the face of British terrorism last year, and insulting not merely to the movement, but to the dignity of the nation because the national cause is something far higher than party politics. So this is pretty standard fair, and this is what labor and the farmers have to push against, basically, to establish their um, legitimacy, okay? It touches most of the points uh, made by Sinn Féin during the revolution. Politics should be national and anti-sectional. The Sinn Féin organization represented all classes and all shades of nationalist opinion, and politics was as much about gratitude for past service and sacrifice as it was about future prospects. Okay? That latter issue is basically what the Army Mutiny was about in 1924, right? Are decisions going to be made based on past service or are they going to be made on other criteria? Um, none of these factors promoted the creation of an oppositional party system. The pro treaty wing of Sinn Fein, although generally more favorable to non Sinn Fein participation in the election because all labor and farmers candidates were pro treaty, also assailed the new labor and farmers doll deputies as being merely sectional and thus less important than the remnants of Sinn Féin. The pro-treaty party, eventually called Fine Gael, continued to claim that they were not a mere political party, but a national movement that transcended class, creed, geography, and vocation. In the early days of the state, Richard Mulcahy connected the treatyites to this period of revolutionary unity. He said, the national party that was the strength of the work of the past few years, too, has been broken, but a sufficiently large section of it still holds together. We have left to us a very great national responsibility, a national duty, to see that the national party shall strengthen itself, shall solidify and recover its old national strength to pull the country through this crisis. Mulcahy still believed, despite the obvious split over the treaty, in this revival of a national movement instead of the normal appearance of competing parties, and signaled that politics, in his mind, was still the domain of nationalists. Uh, Ernest Blythe proposed to call the Treaty Act Party the National Party, a motion that only lost by a couple of votes to the choice of Gale. And uh, then the party's 1923 address to the nation maintained that, quote, it is of prime importance that the program shall have a wide national aspect, aspect, embracing objects befitting the whole people of Ireland rather than just sectional interests. A North Dublin election flyer from 1927 similarly proclaimed that the policy of the government is broad in conception national in character, solicitous only for the common good. On every issue, it has taken decision unflinchingly, thereby courting unpopularity with strongly entrenched interests. Coming to Gale is not anti-farmer, it is not anti-labor, it is national. And basically, the, the depiction here is that only this national party
party is willing and strong enough to stand up to sectional interests. Local parties like labor and farmers were perceived as caving to special interests and not national interests. Okay? So, in my analysis, the ways in which the labor party, and to a lesser extent the farmers party, chose to meet this challenge played a key role in establishing Irish democracy as the positions and practices established by the labor party modeled the role of a loyal opposition that would eventually be taken up in a lot of forms by Fianna Fáil once de Valera decided to enter the doll. Um, Labour had to stake out an oppositional position for itself that was different from other pro-treaty parties, but blended with acceptable revolutionary goals and tropes. To start, Labour had to prove that it was Irish. One of the common things thrown against it was that it was international, right? So, uh, Labour had to establish its Irish pedigree. Um, although Cattle O'Shannon, initially Johnson's second command and a longtime labor organizer, at times spoke in Irish at rallies, um, labor generally tried to show its Irishness through a discussion of the indigenous genealogy of its ideals, rather than through use of the native tone. The party's paper invoked Wolf Tone and James Fitton Lawler in a 1919 editorial, and referenced Tone's appeal to the men of no property in a 1922 campaign ad. Labor TDs were told to pin their faith to the gospel as preached to us by Connolly and Lawler. Quotes from Fitton Lawler, uh, Connolly, Davitt, and Pierce were presented in 1922 under the heading Carry On the True National Tradition. Um, interestingly, the Connolly who was invoked was almost always Connolly the parliamentary reformer and not Connolly the armed insurrectionist, who certainly Johnson didn't mention very often, and even his associates like uh, Shannon and William Ryan didn't much either. Um, Connolly was also merged with Pierce, the most, probably the most socioeconomically radical of the other 1916 signatories, um, as a supporter of Gaelicism and populism. A Labour Party ad said, it will be well for the future peace of Ireland if men and women who draw their inspiration from the teaching of Pierce are brought to see that he, no less than Connolly, desired a republic which should be a real people state, in essence a true workers' republic. Workers too must see that they are betraying Connolly and his cause if they refuse to or omit from their workers' republic a Gaelic state, a recreation of the ancient Irish-speaking and Gaelic-thinking democracy. Although Labour generally praised the revolution, its relationship initially to parliamentary democracy was complicated. The party expressed skepticism as to the morality and utility of what it perceived as a fundamentally bourgeois parliament, while keeping the focus initially on Labour's ultimate goal of a workers' republic. An early issue of the Watchword of Labor, one of the several labor papers, aimed to, quote, preach the whole and entire gospel of James Connolly and make that grand gospel of a workers' republic. Even Thomas Johnson in 1922 made a lengthy speech in the doll, and Johnson was fairly moderate, about the need to transcend mere political freedom, a reasonable thing, but we must continually bear in mind that political freedom and enfranchisement is but sounding brass and tinkling cymbals unless we use that freedom for the purpose of social, economic, and cultural freedom, okay? And he says, unless we're gonna use political freedom to the end of releasing the country and the people from, the, from its other subjections, okay? Which he earlier says is the incubus of capital. Um, nothing has been achieved. After all, nationality, nationhood, is but a means to an end. Labor initially remained unsure about whether parliamentary democracy could bring about the Workers' Republic. In October 1921, the voice of labor criticized the lack of debate in the revolutionary doll. And it wrote, it is not for such as we who have no illusions, either about formal democracy or parliamentary institutions, to teach Irish democratic parliamentarians their business. But it is obvious that someone must. And it is obvious that within the doll there is no informed and competently led criticism and opposition on affairs of purely internal administration. Kyle O'Shannon wrote, the truth is not always found simply by counting heads. And after the treaty was approved by the doll, the voice of labor asked if the government would favor a, quote, outworn and effete parliamentary system or establish a system in agreement with modern needs. However, as the Civil War heated up, or the past of the Civil War heated up, and labor began establishing itself, that hostility to parliamentary democracy was reduced, and the party began justifying its electoral participation in stronger terms. When it became clear that the doll would continue to be the government of the country, the voice of labor wrote, the hour is now struck for the workers to emerge from the shade. When the contest opens in the political arena, we 
shall take our place. The same editorial argued that this was an honorable position as long as the ultimate focus maintained remained on the workers' republic. It's no retrogression on the part of the Labor Party to avail of the machinery of whatever political instruments may be fashioned in pursuit of our objective. Um, the special Congress that voted for labor to actually run candidates in 1922 resolved that labor ought to have its representatives in the forthcoming parliament to work in labor's interests, to frustrate reactionary measures, and to use every occasion to hasten the progress towards the workers' republic. The parties in the 1922 election manifesto noted that only a strong labor party will prevent the neglect of workers' interests by the dollar. It made it clear they didn't trust either wing of Sinn Féin to look out for those. Labor also would ensure that the party was multi, or that parliament was multi-party. And quote, the Labor Party will insist that the new assembly shall be a working body bearing the responsibilities of government, not merely a public meeting called together occasionally to approve or disapprove of the past actions of the ministry, which is what they thought the revolutionary parliament was, basically a rubber stamp for stuff that had already happened. They wanted to actually go through the process of making uh, legislation. Labor also began to stake out a wider position than just a critic of treaty and socioeconomic policy. As it became clear that the doll was going to be deprived of its second largest party due to abstention, Johnson took on the task of criticizing the government on a much wider front than Labor's normal economic concerns, uh, both policy towards England and particularly civil liberties. This initially manifested as a critique of what Labor called militarism. As labor leaders perceived, the democratic civil society was threatened by both the IRA and the National Army. With no prospect of a workers' republic in sight, labor increasingly had to support parliamentarianism, however bourgeois, against what it perceived as the creeping militarism of both wings of Sinn Féin. This stand was derived from what labor called its, quote, traditional principle of opposition to militarism from any quarter. We protested against the gun and the bayonet when handled by foreign armies. We protest against the rule of the gun and the bomb on hand by Irish armies and irresponsible individuals. So they want to tie this to what they perceive as their history of anti-colonialism and resisting British um, militarism. Okay? The party did not want to drift, however, too far away from its revolutionary base, and Labour made it clear that it was not opposed to military force in all circumstances. Uh, a Labour speaker said, let this be clearly understood. Irish Labour's opposition is directed against militarism, not against the use of military force. Irish labor recognizes none better that under certain circumstances the application of armed force is both necessary and desirable. Many even in Irish labor will go so far as to say that under certain circumstances an armed force of the workers is necessary. Even Johnson, who was hardly an insurrectionary firebrand and described himself as a Menshevik on numerous occasions, told the crowd that labor were not here as pacifists. They were there to denounce the spirit of military ascendancy. The frequent postponement of the third doll, its meeting, the initial meeting was postponed several times because of the Civil War, gave Labour even more reason to elevate the importance of the Parliament, as the party had been unable to stop the drift towards war and appeared helpless to reverse the policies of the Treaty I government from outside the doll. In July 1922, Labour said that, quote, the immediate assembling of the third doll was a national necessity, not even second in importance to the necessities of the military situation. By August of 1922, Labor threatened to resign its seats to which it had been elected unless the doll met soon, thus threatening to undermine the new doll's uh, legitimacy as a multi-party body. Kyle O'Shannon said, if they, the government, want to live up to their constitutionalism and up to their democracy, let them come down to the first principle of democracy. And as we understand it, the first principle of democracy as interpreted in this country is that the body of the people should speak through their elected representatives and that their elected representatives, not half a dozen of their elected representatives, are the spokesmen of the nation. Attacks on this militarism allowed labor to emphasize its democratic credentials and to do what I, what I argue it particularly did in trying to establish itself as an opposition party, and that's take up the mantle of a defender of civil liberties. A labor editorial in late 1922, which the author pointedly and repeatedly noted was difficult to pass through the military censors, complained, nowhere except in the ranks of labor and in the labor press is there the least regard for any of the liberties of which there is so much boasting. Former Connolly associate William O'Brien's election address from 1923 claimed that labor alone of all parties in the state recognized the civil liberties of the people, of all the people all the time. It shall be steadfast in its opposition to all militaristic and bureaucratic encroachments upon civil rights. 
Labor's defense of civil liberties highlighted its transition to a less tactical support of parliamentary democracy, as in 1924 when it told County Dublin, Dublin electors that labor alone amongst all parties had steadily adhered to the democratic principle of government by the people and for the people, and not that of fooling the people with mere constitutional window dressing. Labor's vision of an oppositional role was laid out fairly cogently in the run-up to the 1923 election, in which it was claimed that a strong turnout for labor would check the extravagant, violent, and budding militarism of this administration and insist that working-class majority of this nation rules and that it is determined that economic security and freedom shall be secured for all citizens of this country. Thomas Johnson realized that this role had only fallen to labor because of the odd situation created by Sinn Féin abstention. But he also believed that a parliament needed an opposition in order to function. And he resisted calls to withdraw from the doll as the treatyites began executing Republicans. A common tactic for the Irish party had been withdrawal, right, at particularly contested times. And Jonathan was urged to do that repeatedly. Um, this, this particular defense that he makes of non-withdrawal comes in response to a Labour Party uh, branch from Kildare urging him to, to withdraw. He says, to demand that the Labour members of the Dáil should withdraw as a protest against the recent acts of the government, and he's talking about the executions here in the fall of 22, um, is equivalent to demanding that Labour should refuse to take part in the political activities of the country until we're in a position to take over the government ourselves. It is practically saying that we should never take part in a parliament until the majority thinks as we think. Labor's political identity, therefore, became increasingly tied to that of an independent, wide-ranging, critical voice within a democratic parliament. The farmers, on the other hand, opposed the government on much narrower grounds, but provided criticism from the right and thus enabled the doll to simulate a normal parliamentary system in the absence of the anti-treaty acts. I couldn't find a picture of Dennis Boyd, the leader of the Farmers Party, so I put up a picture of the book I edited that has a chapter on the Farmers Party by me in it, <laughs> <laughs> which is a fairly narcissistic choice I recognize, but it's a choice I made and I'm going to stand by. <laughs> so uh, the farmers tend to support, uh, often silently, the government's foreign policy and commitment to law and order. And in so doing, they thought, sought to limit the scope of opposition to economic issues. That was their definition of an opposition party, um, which they tried to do so they could avoid getting their members tangled in political questions like the oath that they thought would cause division within the farmers' ranks. The Farmers' Party newspaper repeatedly lamented the dominance of political questions at the polls and urged farmers to vote based on economic interests, not on political questions, the treaty, basically. Okay. Um, the farmers aggressively promoted their economic vision, free trade, low taxes and rates, and reductions in public services, because they felt the unnatural dominance of Sinn Féin during the revolution had excluded farmers from their rightful position in the free state. They claimed that they constituted two-thirds of the population, created 85% of the wealth, and, quote, found themselves debarred from the councils of the nation. Farmers hoped that the revolution would usher in an era in which agrarian issues dominated government policy, reversing what they saw as years of British neglect. Instead, to the farmers, the revolution brought irresponsible spending, crushing taxation, and local councils run by Sinn Feiners with no agrarian roots. So the farmers' conception of opposition was to focus on economic issues and focus on representing what they claimed were people who were underrepresented, and that's farmers themselves. They tended to see politicians as urban, educated, bureaucratic elites. Okay. Um, the Farmers' Party is endlessly quotable, and I could spend hours up here just reading quotes that amused me from the Farmers' Party, and I will refrain from doing that. I'll read a few. But um, the Farmers, my favorite was the, I'm referring to myself again, but the, uh, the, the chapter in this book is, is from a farmer's quote where they refer to the government as a regime of squander mania. <laughs> I love the word squander mania. Um, I, I have tried to insert it in the conversation. Um, <laughs> The farmers perceived the central government as a playground for urbane, educated elites who cared little about the land. Dennis Gorey, parliamentary leader of the Farmers' Party until 1927, when he joined Brugel, said, we got into the spending habit during the war and we have not got out of it yet. This is most remarkable among our professional business and official people. The fault is not of agriculture, but of the parasites living on the back of agriculture. The Dublin picture houses and theaters are overflowing night and day. Gorey talked about the cinema quite a lot and how there were too many people going to it. Um, and they are building more of them. 
And who is paying for it all? Does it need any answer? The cart horse of the country, the farm laborer, and the farmer. A speaker at a farmers' union meeting in 1925 blamed taxation for the agricultural depression and said, quote, all the public offices and institutions were overstaffed and the officials overpaid. Reductions all round would have to be made in that sphere. Gorey at times claimed that there was rampant overstaffing in the railroads, said the workers are for the most part of the day doing nothing. In the Senate, I think the place is overstaffed doing nothing. In the post office, it is quite a common thing in the West and rural districts that a postman should not deliver more than one letter in a whole week. The rural districts of Ireland are not inhabited by letter writing people. Um, and in the army, I like the throwaway quality of this one. And in the army, probably there are too many typists employed. I have seen some of them sometimes dancing instead of typing. <laughs> I could go on at great length with these. I've reduced it to four. Um, he also complained bitterly about the cost of education. Uh, claiming that, quote, we have too much education in Kilkenny because it's costing them more than any other people in the world. Um, a f uh, one of the labor deputies no noted that that particular speech was met by laughter in the doll, like not just the government benches, but particularly from the labor um, benches. Um, Connor Hogan, a farmer's TD, made the claim that they were, quote, being literally blood sucked by this mass of officials. And less distressingly, another supporter of the farmer said the free state was a paradise for officials. This is a constant um, refrain in farmers' rhetoric, that the state is becoming livable only for officials, by which they tended to mean urban bureaucrats, not farmers, and farmers were paying for this all. It was constantly, and they thought their role as an opposition party was to call attention to that, what they saw as, as uh, waste and overspending, okay? Um, even though neither labor nor the farmers ever came close to obtaining a majority, the positions these parties staked out in the early free state doll are critical to the development of democracy in the free state. Unlike the anti-treatyites, labor and the farmers voiced their discontent from within the parliament. So that's half the battle there to start with, right? Functioning as a loyal opposition that accepted the legitimacy of state institutions while subjecting the government's policies to criticism on their merits. The substance of these criticisms would later be taken up by Fianna Fáil when it became a parliamentary party. Uh, Fianna Fáil generally emulated labor's criticism of Puma Gael as in the pockets of the rich, and generally emulated the farmer's criticism of the government as overspending, particularly on elite um, bureaucrats. Fianna Fáil adds in 27 and in 32 listed salaries of high-ranking bureaucrats as a way of uh, talking about government uh, excessive spending. Um, perhaps more importantly, labor and the farmers took part in the rituals of parliamentary politics voting on motions, proposing amendments, opposing second readings, etc. This quotidian activity and the opposition to government policy that was voiced through it was necessary to the legitimacy of the free state doll. Without a viable opposition party and without contested votes and motions, without the rituals of parliamentary behavior, five readings, uh, amendments, um, the divisions, this kind of thing, ritualized behavior, um, it's difficult to see how the doll could have gained legitimacy during the five years of anti-treaty abstention. Without realistic opposition, the doll could have become like basically the Stormont Parliament in the North, widely seen as a front for one-party rule. Um, the tortured path by which anti-treatyites eventually entered the doll is certainly important in the cementing of Irish democracy. But so too are the efforts of the Labour and Farmers Party to create a loyal opposition in the early years of the state. This ensured that the doll entered by Fianna Fáil in 1927 was functional, multi-party, and seen widely as legitimate, not entirely, but by a large swath of the population. Factors which I think induced Fianna Fáil to begin its transition away from the non-recognition of the state. Thank you. temporary agricultural labors. 
laborers. So the, ch the chances of them, and that's why they could never, even if the government didn't have enough people in the House for a division, they were not going to vote together on almost any issue. There was one, I can think of one, um, there was an amendment to the land bill that sought to give farmers better terms by which they could purchase their land that labor for and voted for. But by and large, they did not support each other on anything and hate each other. A uh, labor deputy said that, that Gorey wanted to hang farmer or hang uh, labor from the land post, and the general went down from there. Um, <laughs> so they were not going to agree on anything. One of the, one of the other um, endlessly quotable Dennis Gorey quotes that I could have given was, he complained constantly about labor, particularly hired by the Devil Corporation, that it was overpaid, did nothing. He said, you have to have a microscope to see their movements. Um, <laughs> and so there was, the, he thought, he thought, it, this is interesting, this is, a, this is another paper I'm gonna present at ACES this summer, but um, labor, or, I mean, the farmers tended to think that Ireland was performing poorly economically because it was taxed too high and because its workers were pampered and didn't perform. And labor constantly put out statistics about how American bricklayers, I mean, I'm sorry, the farmers constantly put out statistics about how American bricklayers laid X number of bricks an hour, and Irish bricklayers laid one quarter X. Or um, American elementary school teachers made X, and Irish elementary school teachers made four X. I mean, they were constantly um, talking about the low productivity of Irish capital L labor and small L labor, and they blamed the economic performance on that. And labor obviously didn't take that well. So yeah, they didn't. Agree. No, there was a, they did introduce them, yes, and there was a few that got second readings, and there was a, um, the one that got closest that the government was going to adopt parts of, there was a um, railway amalgamation bill that Labor had started because it had been a committee that they, so yes, they did try to introduce private members' bills. Um, Johnson in particular, uh, and Labor tabled amendments to just about everything, and so they participated that way. The farmers less so. The farmers complained, but, um, they amended some economic bills, but not not generally. Well, one of the things that's in the one of the things about our ancestral systems is that farmers try to build broader consensus in the public and so on. Yeah. It seems that these two parties were just playing to their base all the time. Did they ever try and win broader public consensus for, yeah. you know, to, uh, and did that ever succeed? They were both keenly aware of that. Um, the farmers thought that their base was the majority of the population. And they thought the problem was that ordinary farmers, I don't know why I'm pointing at us. As I've said many times, if I had to grow my own food, I'd be dead. <laughs> but um, but the, the farmers complained all the time that ordinary farmers voted for the pro or anti-treaty party instead of for a farmer's party. And if they could just convince farmers to vote for the farmer's party, the farmers would dominate the state because they dominated the state of America. So they tried, they didn't think they had to broaden to another social group. They thought they had to get their social group, yeah, to vote for them. Labor tried, and I think that the, the focus on civil liberties and all that was an attempt to broaden its message. It tried to put itself forward as both the kind of community, and the way we think of labor, right, as a communitarian party that would support um, unemployment insurance, parks, libraries, more money for schools, that kind of thing, but also as a defender of individual liberties. And I think they thought that that um, stance as a defender of individual liberties would capture some people who didn't like the treatyites but were, didn't want to waste their vote on abstention. Basically. It didn't work. Yes, and to be honest, that's a part I haven't looked at yet. If there's that book was back up there, there's a chapter in it on the Senate by Elaine Byrne, who poses the Senate as an office source of opposition. And I intend to incorporate ex-unionists in that into it. I haven't done that yet. But yes, they did. And some of the um, some of the ex-unionists in the doll functioned in that way, but most of the ex-unionists in the doll um, functioned as vocational representation. So they voiced the interests of doctors or um, lawyers, people, if it's given, people like that, right? And so they, they tended to see themselves as more narrowly articulating, like uh, I can think of Sir James Craig, not the James Craig from Northern Ireland, but a deputy from uh, Trinity College, who constantly talked about the government's tariff policies and how it was hurting hospital supplies and things like that. 
or the motor car tariff and how that was hurting uh, doctors' house calls. And so they tended to voice narrow kind of upper class vocational opposition. Questions to the um, fascinating business about the idea that there should be no, you know, the, just before this, there was a break of the party so there should be a, a united front on everything and the opposition was wrong. And then the minority being that they, they were the carrier. I mean, that rests with you know, the romantic national views <coughs> and the general will. And so yes, it is, yeah. But, but out of that, if that was their mentality, should, was there not a move to have why would this, do they force you to a parliamentary dispute or centrally executive government with a stronger executive, uh, a bit more powerful presidential figure? Was there ever a move for that? Uh, they, they toyed with that when they're writing the Constitution in 22. Um, one of the things that's floated is what they get, the, I think they steal it from Switzerland, which was a government sits for three years no matter what. Ministers do what they do. Yeah, and so they did talk about that. It was not implemented at the end of the day. Um, and they also talked about um, a system, I, I think honestly, um, sincerely I should say, um, that a number of treatyites and anti-treatyites envisioned that they would not have parties, that they would have a group of national representatives who would vote in different ways on different issues, you know, and that there would be temporary coalitions but not permanent parties. The problem is, and they had all sorts of devices to try to do this. Um, in the 1922 Constitution, they had what they called extern ministers, which, could have, which were ministers who were not part of the government, but they supervised the department. And if their proposals got shot down, the government wasn't going to fall, basically. So not a quite a parliamentary system. But the problem was, because the issue of treaty, no treaty, dominated everything, and the government couldn't afford to lose a vote for fear of losing the treaty, all of these kind of ideas that are, that are rooted about go out the window pretty quickly, and the government has to put the whips on to get, represent, to get votes through. Um, but they do talk in all sorts of idealistic terms about how they weren't going to have parties. They were just going to have a national movement with temporary factions. Before we yeah. go to the reception, was there, I thought, one question maybe on this side? Or? No, I mean, it's sort of answer. I was going to ask, why did farmers support the farm party, or the same with labor? Was there, and was there a change to the 20s of that sort of, of that level of support? Um, the perception was that the farmers were kind of um, an appendage of Kumun anyhow. And so you may as well vote for the treaty I can for those farmers who tended towards that direction. They were never able to quite establish their independence in the public mind, both with potential supporters and enemies. And so the higher profile, better funded candidates tended to get, tended to get support. And Fina Fall, particularly under Lamaze, was very good. There was a perception also that the Farmers Party stood for wealthy farmers and not for landless laborers, you know? And so Fina Fall was very good at taking those folks and getting them to vote for and a treaty party instead of the Farmers Party. The Farmers Party tried to say it represents all farmers, you know, grazers, tillage farmers, laborers, landless, you know, agrarian workers. But the perception was that it was a party of wealthier tillage farmers or wealthier grazers. And it had trouble appealing to the non-wealthy um, farmers. So, but it constantly bemoaned that. Its leaders bemoaned that. Well, before we, oh, is there one question? Uh, this might be another question, but having taken your empire class and like the information you're really everything back to Nash, uh, the global yep. scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find it interesting that uh, the majority of other nations that then turn to Ireland as this beacon of, of you know, Republicans and you look to dead mm -hmm. uh, as if this first beacon of hope. I was wondering if this idea of, of opposition, like patriotic opposition through labor or farmers comes up anywhere in in other places, this, this idea that they inspire um, comes up when other nations are trying to break away from the dominance of the British Empire, or it's just been swept aside to kind of for Deb to set it. Yeah, most of most of them looked up to Deb as the sort of because because the farmers didn't have a lot of anti-colonial credentials, honestly. They spoke nicely of the revolution, um, but a lot of them were not intimate participants in it, a lot of their leaders. So they didn't have that kind of anti-colonial credibility that would appeal to a decolonized world the same way that Deb would. Um, and labor 
was generally seen internationally as, again, kind of a weak sister of the British Labour Party, which was already seen not very, as very, not very fiery, you know? And so, not particularly, I would say Johnson is admired personally in international labor circles. Um, Johnson comes to the United States in 1925 or 26 to meet with the, uh, to attend a meeting of the uh, Interparliamentary Union, so a group of parliamentarians from across the world. And um, he criticizes the Brits to their face and about how they keep meddling in Irish business and stuff. And he gets a fair amount of sort of national or international press for that. But I wouldn't say that labor, Irish labor, is seen as a, as a, as a beacon of much. Even Connolly is not that incorporated into wider European labor thought in the way that some of the German labor thinkers are, I would say. But that's one thing that I think is interesting about the Farmers' Party is, I mean, the blue shirts are going to come along later, right? But at the time, Ireland didn't have a right-wing party that was anti-state in the 20s in the same way that you see in lots of other right. In the French Republic, for example, right, where a number of the parties on the left and right wanted to get rid, dismantle the Republic, right? The farmers aren't going that far. Blue shirts, are going to get into the film, but, um, but I think that's one of the things that makes them interesting. But I wouldn't say they were vegan. They thought they were behind. They always wanted to copy other countries. Farmers wanted to learn from Denmark in particular, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, other small countries. So, yeah. Mark Weber worked out a lot. On the question of labor, were they like, playing double opposition? Did they contest in the North too? Um, they started, they intended to function as uh, one party over the entire state. In the 20s, that fell apart pretty quickly, and the Northern Irish Labor Party became more or less independent. Um, Johnson had actually cut his teeth in Belfast, uh, organizing with Connolly. That's what he knew actually better. Than him. But, and, and the intent was to, to continue to be united, but by and large, they did not. Um, there is some talk about the North. The labor papers in the 20s had a semi-regular feature called In the We Parliament, which is what they called the Northern Irish Parliament, that covered Northern Irish events, you know, and covered the Belfast City Council and things like that. Um, but it, it was not really a unified, a unified organization, despite, I think, good intentions on that, and despite the northern origins of a number of the labor, uh, labor leaders. Yeah. We can certainly continue the conversation a little bit. We'll still be warm and hot and urgent. <laughs> Uh, but before thanking you with another round of applause, which you well deserve for this, as promised, groundbreaking talk, there are two other things that we should be thanking Jason for. Uh, one is for the course that he's taught. We actually have our, our Bird Scholars uh, teach a course uh, during the semester that they spend in residencies. We have several of your students uh, with us here on the, the course on the Island of Empire, which you've uh, been leading. And I'm, I'm just feeling the energy walking by the room, and you know, uh, I can see that it's been some really good discussions you've had. Thank you for that. Next um, week they're reading one of my articles, but it's past the end job deadline. <laughs> 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 I think you've got a book now. I don't see any. I don't see any. I think it's there. We're both past that. We're safe. I see things late sometimes. Can you discussions like we're here? Uh, and the other thing, maybe for which you might have said more about it, I'm not so you were at uh, uh, two Saturdays ago, this wonderful symposium that Jason led and organized on the question, is there an American school of Irish history? And I think we have uh, answered that metaphor again this afternoon with the very profound it. Yes, we had a dozen scholars, uh, some of your, uh, your peers, mentors, students, uh, uh, really a generational uh, uh, conference and symposium that we had. That was really quite wonderful, supported by the Center for Irish Programs and the Family, family Fund, so we're grateful for that. Uh, and, and even more personally, we love seeing your reader. Many of our Burns scholars spend lots of time, that's why you become a Burns scholar, spend time with our resources at Burns Library, the Elenia Library, and you have been one of the more assiduous ones, and I think you've seen evidence of that in your talk. So, uh, so with that, let us thank uh, 